hello again. Uh, apologize for the delay. Thank you for your patience. So the topic of the presentation would be driving the transport and industrial decarbonization revolution. On the presentation, we will basically focus on two aspects of how we operate within the composite space. The first would be uh, initially we'll talk a little about the company itself. Then we'll dive into the uh, pro uh, products we have for the gas transportation. And at the end, we will talk a little bit about the heavy duty application of our composite technology. So first, very shortly about the company itself. Just, uh, just a very short, short clip about the, about the company itself. Uh, so in terms of a vision of the, of the company, we do believe that clean air everywhere is, is our motto and the vision. And we do believe that having a clean air is not a privilege, but it should be uh, something which is accepted globally and every person in the world should, should have free access to it. Our purpose is really to drive the energy transformation by implementation of the high capacity, low weight storage solutions. And our value, uh, which, is, which is spread it quite well actually through the organization is integrity and drive. When you look at the Hexagon Composites uh, as a company, we are a Norwegian based company. Uh, we are listed on uh, Oslo Stock Exchange. Uh, so we are a publicly owned uh, company. We are a global leader in type four, so fully composite cylinders manufacturing uh, selling and of course we are also providing number of number of systems in that application until today we have released to the market more than 800,000 uh, type 4 cylinders so as you can see it's, it's rather high capacity and high volume business since since many years we are the trusted and approved supplier to the number of uh, leading OEMs globally and leading fleets especially in the US and our turnover in 2022 reached 4.5 a 9 billion NOC, which is roughly 500 million euro. And again, I would like to point out that almost 100% of our turnover is coming from the alternative fuel space. So it's really quite a large company, uh, definitely a couple of times bigger than, than any closest competitor in that field. When we think about the timeline and uh, the most uh, important developments in the company for the years, uh, we have started as early as 1963. So we have started in, uh, with the filament winding uh, production uh, for NASA. So we, we actually have that technology in, under our rings since, since six decades. Uh, the hexagon composites as known today was established in the year of 2000. Another quite important milestone was uh, opening the joint venture with Agility Fuel Systems which added the system capabilities to, to our portfolio outside of the, the uh, previously owned know-how related type 4 cylinders. Uh, also in 2015, uh, a Japanese conglomerate Mitsui have invested in our company and today they own uh, almost 25% of the company. And last but not least, uh, the latest developments in 2021, we have spun off the company called Hexagon Purus, which is taking care of the zero emission applications, uh, namely hydrogen and battery technologies. And in our April 2022, we have also added uh, the company from, uh, from Graz in Austria called Cryo Shelter, which is taking care of the liquefied uh, gases solutions, namely LNG and LH2 for the trucking. Uh, at glance about the company again, 1,700 employees in 23 different locations. Uh, we've talked about the, the turnover already. Uh, and as, again, we, we know composites in six decades, so definitely we have the longest history and track record with, with that technology. 
In terms of the driving the energy transformation and, re and real impact which, uh, which our products are providing to, to the environment. So because of the uh, in introduction of our products uh, to our customers in 2022, we have been able to, uh, to avoid 1.35 million metric tons of CO2 just by utilization of our products with, with our customers globally. So I think it shows also the scale and the impact of the, of the company which we have already today. In terms of the technology, uh, we basically stand on two legs. The one is the Type 4, so the composite cylinder, uh, which we have been introducing to the market since 1993. And the second part of the business, which is becoming more and more important, is the system itself. So we are not only selling, we actually try to avoid this, to sell the cylinders. We, we prefer to provide a com complete solutions for the, for the customers. Uh, when we just talk about cylinder uh, itself, uh, Type 4 cylinder is, uh, is a cylinder with plastic liner. Uh, and uh, winding uh, made out of carbon fiber or gas fiber or both, or both of them. The cylinder is light. Uh, on the typical application for C engine hydrogen, type 4 cylinder is roughly 70, 70 to 75% lighter than the steel. We have no metal in our liner technology, meaning that we have no fatigue or we don't have a corrosion uh, in the outside or in the outside of the cylinder. And this represents by itself a number, uh, number of benefits for, for the customers. As mentioned, we are non-corrosive, so for the entire lifetime of the product, you won't see any corrosion on our product, either inside or the outside of the cylinder. Uh, we have great resistance against the fatigue, especially, it's very important, especially on the, on the high pressure solutions, such as 700 bar cylinders for, for the hydrogen. Basically, for that application, type four is the only cylinder uh, available today. Uh, we have leak-free technology, so we can guarantee that our cylinder won't leak for the entire lifetime of the product, which is at least 20 years. And mentioned previously, our cylinder is 70 to 75 percent lighter uh, than a steel product. I've mentioned a little bit about these systems. So, core of our business today in the hexagon agility is a system which we provide to the heavy-duty industry. We have currently in operation more than 70,000 uh, trucks and buses uh, running running with our systems. You can see the names of the, of the companies that's either leading OEMs or one of the largest fleets we have globally. And also we have, uh, and Filippo will talk about it, we have more than 1,800 distribution modules running globally transporting either hydrogen or natural gas. Uh, that's also globally. We have, we have applications from uh, uh, running in Sweden up to Latin America. So it's truly global product which is, which is supporting the transition of the, of the alternative fuels. And I would like Filippo to step in to talk a little bit about the mobile pipelines. Thank you, Thank you Milos. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I guess so. My, my name is Filippo Munna. I'm sales director at Hexagon Agility, and I'm in charge of the mobile pipeline solutions. So, so basically, my job is to uh, find the right application for these beautiful lightweight composite material containers. We have several sizes. We'll go into the detail uh, later. And uh, to start my, my story, uh, I have decided to, to use a slide which, which I used only nine months ago when we were here together at World Biogas and uh, Hexagon sponsored a, s a round table focused on uh, how to scale up uh, biomethane production, especially in light of Repower U. Uh, I, I started my presentation with this very same slide and I decided to use it again because I think it gives the two key points. You know, we all believe that biomethane is the cleanest fuel available today. Yet, uh, we have a potential for about 840 billion cubic meters of biomethane and uh, globally, uh, we produce 34 only. So, uh, for example, and we have seen it before, Repower EU asks, for 35 alone, but, but in Europe we could even do better. So how can we do better? Uh, the good news is that not only the European Union, but also uh, the majors are realizing this. Uh, so we have, uh, ever, since, ever since the previous edition of World Biogas, we have news about British Petroleum, Shell, but even banks like Goldman Sachs investing on, uh, on biomethane plants. Uh, we can add uh, Total, uh, any, so it's really, really becoming popular. Uh, the challenge is that uh, we need to find a feedstock. And the f most of the feedstock is, is away from the grid. 
is away from the point where you would use it. Either uh, a point of use can be any, an, indus an industry or an injection point on the grid. Uh, so very briefly, 24% uh, of the uh, feedstock is from animal manure. Uh, today, uh, only 7% of biomethane uh, comes from anim animal, uh, animal manure. Even worse with uh, agriculture waste, you know, 59% uh, of the potential feedstock comes from agriculture and uh, only 3% is utilized. Uh, the situation is a little bit better with wastewater and, uh, and landfill waste, but let's say that the, 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 the big quantity is uh, stranded, is, is away from the grid. So how do we bring biomethane to the market? Uh, Milos has already introduced our solution. We manufacture very light uh, cylinders made of composite material. These cylinders are 75% light, percent lighter than traditional steels one. So we uh, allow to transport two to three times the amount of gas that would be transported with the traditional technology and yet uh, with no need of a fancy equipment for uh, the compression of the gas. We can use traditional compressors which are uh, relatively inexpensive and, uh, and uh, easy to maintain. So that, that's the key of our value proposition, uh, keeping the uh, CapEx investment under control and, and uh, offering a, a huge savings in, in OPEX. Uh, I have numbers to show, they will come in my next slides. So probably many of you already know uh, what a virtual pipeline is. However, l l let me summarize it. We also have a nice video, by the way. Uh, a compressor located at the uh, biomethane plant fills our containers to capacity. Uh, the industry uses 250 bar, but yeah, our technology would allow to go even at higher pressure. And by the way, we build containers for transportation of hydrogen, and there we go even up to 500 bar. And, and still we are uh, extremely light. When the container is filled to capacity, it travels to the point of use. Uh, we have applications in the, between 10 kilometers distance up to 900 kilometers. And normally this kind of product uh, is financially viable when you need to move between say 10,000 cubic meters of gas up to say half a million cubic meters of gas per day. So we are abundantly within the range of application of a biomethane plant. When the, when the container reaches the point of use, uh, it starts decanting gas and the empty container, of course, is collected by the truck and brought back to the filling station. Here we have a nice video, it's taken in North America. It shows a North American product approved according to US DOT, but the concept would be the same in Europe. So this is... This is how we fill our container. It's, it's extremely easy to handle. Uh, all the valves and the manifold are located at the back of the container. Filling, of course, depends on the performance of the compressor, but normally takes between half and one hour and a half and, uh, and three hours. And then the travel uh, begins. So in Europe, I would say we would talk about distances between 10 to maybe 50, 60 kilometers, because we have a quite well-developed grid. When the container reaches the decompression station or the injection point, uh, it's also extremely easy to connect it to the decanting equipment, disconnect the empty container. It takes about 20 minutes to do this operation, and then the driver can bring the container back, uh, the empty container back to the compression station. So in a nutshell, this is, this is our solution. And uh, we have sold about 1,800 of these containers globally. As Milos pointed out, we have 60 years experience with this technology. Uh, all the containers on the space shuttle were manufactured by Lincoln Composite that today is Hexagon uh, Lincoln. So we have experience, we have started with the aerospace uh, industry and then we have uh, applied our knowledge uh, to the gas industry. So here we see containers actually, uh, this uh, liquid one uh, operating in Scotland. We have containers operating in North America and on the bottom uh, right corner, 
we have a nice uh, road train uh, that operates in Scandinavia. In Scandinavia road, road limits are quite flexible, so we can uh, really pack a, a lot of containers in, in one go. And by doing this, our customers save a lot of money. We will see some numbers. Just let me say a few words about the system, because we have seen how the cylinder is manufactured. I would like to um, explain how the system works, and then we go into numbers. This is, a con this is a drawing of a container sold in North America where long tubes are allowed in Europe. In reality, we have to be within 450 liter uh, wat water capacity. But uh, in terms of feature of the system, the container is the same. So uh, you have seen that all the valves and uh, manifold are located at the back of the container, so they are easy uh, to reach. The container is equipped with a pressure relief device, and most importantly, with system that detect temperature around the container, because the cylinder is made of plastic. So what the cylinder is sensitive is high temperature. The fire protection system detects uh, when uh, the temperature overcomes about 104 degrees C, and at that point, it starts venting the gas. But it needs to be noted that our cylinders have been tested in a bonfire without fire protection system, and there is never an explosion, as opposed to what would naturally happen with metal. Uh, the reason is that this is plastic. This is basically a fiber wrapped and uh, kept together by a resin. When the resin melts, the gas permeate through the fibers and the cylinder collapses. So the cylinder is extremely safe. These cylinders are extremely robust. They have been attacked by terrorists uh, in, in Latin America and shot with 40 millimeter grenade, and nothing has happened, no rupture. Uh, only 15% of the thickness has been uh, scratched. And the frame is also extremely robust. We, had tra we have truck driver being involved in accident, rollovers, uh, no gas leakage. We have been praised by fire bureau department. So we have a... And, and, I, I would need a dedicated presentation to talk about safety, but uh, um, if later you want to approach me, uh, this is a topic where Exxon is extremely, is extremely careful and, and the product is extremely strong. Now back to numbers, which is probably what you, you are interested. I, I said uh, within the range of application of uh, our biomethane project, we believe that our solution is the most financially viable. So here we have, co it's what we do with customers. You know, we, when we discuss a project, we ask uh, what are the main parameters? Uh, how much gas do you need to transport? What is the distance? What is the cost of transport per kilometer? Uh, how long it takes from uh, the biomethane plant until to the injection point? And what is the decanting rate? We, we have a tool and, and then we can see what the capex plus opex is. And, and here we can clearly see uh, we have compared our 40-foot solution and 45-foot solution. So our 40-foot solution carries 11,800 cubic meters of gas, the 45, 13,200 versus a traditional steel solution. As you can see, of course, initially the capex uh, for composite is higher. Uh, carbon fiber is more expensive. Uh, that's a fact. But then we start transporting more gas per trip, uh, two to three times the amount. And in uh, the first case, it's 750 cubic meters an hour. Uh, we break even uh, after a, almost a little bit less than two years. Uh, when the amount of gas to be transported is a bit higher, 1,250 cubic meters an hour, uh, we break even even uh, at about a year. So it's, it's a no-brainer that this is the uh, correct fit. Then we have, here I also have an example, a comparison uh, versus LNG. So we. We are totally agnostic about technology. We respect every uh, type of technology for gas transportation and storage. And it's not a question uh, for this uh, panel. Uh, LNG is definitely the solution when you need to move huge amount of gas through long distances. But here we talk biomethane, we talk 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 cubic meters per day and distances maybe up to 100 kilometers at most. And if I repeat the same exercise and I calculate CAPEX uh, versus OPEX here, I also need to put in the equation the cost of a liquefaction plant and its maintenance. 
And in this case, we don't. We always are below uh, the the curve that represents micro LNG. Here we even see what the cost, total cost of ownership, comparing CNG with LNG would be in case of different production rate uh, per hour. And uh, again, uh, we still utilize the easy to maintain and relatively inexpensive compressors, but at the same time, we transport a lot of gas with one go. And that's where, where our efficiency is. So uh, this is what I wanted to say. Uh, full respect for every technology, but we believe that Type 4 has its own field of application where customer can benefit, can definitely benefit. And uh, the fourth technology would be a pipeline, but even in that case, uh, think about a biomethane plant located 10 kilometers away from the grid, and you need to consider at least uh, 10 million euros investment between building the pipeline and, uh, and the injection point. So. Uh, in any case, it's, it is my job to advise customers, so if, if you have any doubt, I'm, I'm happy to, to review these numbers with you. And then I'll, I think it's time to talk about Type 4 application for transport, and here's the expert, it's Milos. So we will finish presentation with just a couple of slides showing what's possible when that composite technology is implemented to, to trucks and buses, what it really means in terms of achieving the long driving distance uh, with, with the composite technologies. So on the right side, you can see the current dominating solution for, for the trucking, basically globally, which is diesel, allowing customers to run up to 2,000 kilometers per single refueling. And as mentioned by Filippo, we are energy agnostic, but we, we in a way have to compare what's possible for, for different applications and how we could basically, as easy as possible, allow fleets to change from diesel to alternative fuels without uh, forcing them to change uh, the way of operating the, the trucks. So when you think about the BEV, which are becoming very popular, at least on the, on the PR side, uh, with the state-of-the-art technology for a typical 4 by 2 truck, you can get up to 450 kilometers, uh, which, is, which is roughly 25% of what, what you need. And we are not talking here even about the infrastructure charging time and, and the means of operation, which are really totally different than, than the diesel truck. There is obviously a so-called fuel cell slash IC hydrogen alternative, which is also, also heavy, heavily promoted. And we are manufacturing actually uh, 700 bar systems for that application. We even have today denomination from, from two of large OEMs globally. Uh, that being said, we know that even with the largest capacity system available on the market, which are again coming from, from Hexagon, for 700 bar applications, it's really difficult to go higher than 900 kilometers. And we also have to take into account here, obviously, the infrastructure piece and the fact that uh, for that application, you will have to have a station which is allowing to, to fill that truck to 700 bar with at least 80 to 90 kilogram hydrogen. And it's not easy nor a uh, cheap task, uh, task to, to achieve. Obviously, you have bio-LNG or LNG, which is becoming very popular in continental Europe because until today, the space available for the alternative fuel on the truck is, is very limited. And what we want to promote heavily now is, is actually the modern approach towards CNG, because we believe that with a system also mounted behind a cap, which is our bread and butter in the US, uh, that, that solution actually our mainstream product in the US, we can compete with LNG and with the existing infrastructure in Europe, which is reaching more than, I think, 4,000 CNG stations, we are in the position to, to provide composite solution for long haul trucking, uh, reaching up to 2,000 kilometers. Uh, modern problem requires modern solutions, so, so it starts obviously with the system itself. On the left side you can see the typical type 1 system provided today still by leading OEMs in Europe. It consists of uh, four cylinders per side, so in total you have eight cylinders per truck, which are built into bundle, uh, connected together, and as you can see also you, on the left side you, you have all the high pressure area, including the, the valves and the piping quite well exposed to the environment. This solution is quite heavy, have very limited capacity and obviously subject to the corrosion and, and damage. In comparison, what we are promoting today and what we have introduced to the market even in UK is the single cylinder solution. The beauty of the composite technology is that you are no longer limited by a need to manufacture small cylinders. You actually can get an available gap for the storage system and you can fill it with a single tank. So this is what we do. Our cylinder have a higher capacity than four of those uh, presented on the left side. 
they are well covered under the under the cover. The entire high pressure area is integrated into so-called FMM, so fuel fuel management module, which is allowing for very easy maintenance and use, and ov obviously filling. I think the the training for the average driver will take no more than 20 to 30 minutes. And obviously there is there is increase in capacity. And if we translate this to, to the particular OEMs and available platforms, especially in UK, for the six by two, we are in the position to provide more than 500 kilometers driving range on very limited space because on a truck with the free access, you really have, you do not have a lot of space for, for, for the storage system. If we compare our solution on the four by two solutions from Iveco and Scania, we still can reach uh, 800 to 950 kilometers driving range just with two cylinders mounted between the axles. And those are actually the products available uh, on the market in UK, uh, especially six by two, which is I think today 60% of the market in UK. We are expecting very significant growth uh, for that product from 2023 onward. Uh, on top of that, uh, for the fleets, which do not have the appetite to modify the existing truck or they have purchased already a truck with, with steel cylinders and want to increase the driving range. We have also developed a product uh, which is mounted uh, under the uh, trailer. So it's a system which is, which is today fully approved to EC R110, providing also significant additional uh, driving distance for, for, for the trucks. Uh, with uh, our two systems mounted on the truck and then the first system on the trailer, you can actually reach up to eight, uh, 1,800 kilometers driving range, and it's available today. That being said, uh, I've mentioned previously that our main business and mainstream product is, is the so-called uh, ProCap, so the system mount mounted uh, behind the cap. We have really quite significant sales of that product, both in US and in Latin America, and we are currently working on bringing that product also to, to European space. Until recently, it was not possible even to, to think about the product because, again, there was not enough space on the truck. However, because of the uh, discussed currently increased vehicle dimension regulation in Europe and the discussion uh, by European Commission will be finished, we believe, until summer of 2023, there is a chance to, to bring that technology also to the Europe. The baseline for uh, this uh, new legislation is to, is to give both OEMs and the fleets enough space to accommodate the alternative fuels on the truck. Uh, one of the biggest disadvantage of any alternative fuel, uh, either at BV, hydrogen or CNG, is, is energy density. All of those different fuels have less energy density th than a diesel. So in order to provide the, the similar amount of uh, driving distance, you really need to be creative and, and find, a, find a different spot for, for the storage system. We deliver this product in US in thousands uh, per year. And again, it's, uh, it's our main product in US and we, we are looking forward to, to bring the same product to, to Europe as soon as this legislation is completed. We are even today, uh, we're having quite advanced discussions with one of the leading OEMs and we are planning to introduce it to the market already at the end of 2024. When this product is implemented, uh, we are then uh, really reaching the quite significant driving distance in the single frame. So uh, showed previously the range extender, uh, adding our system to, to, the, to the type one system provided by Scania, we can reach 900 kilometers. But if, when we go further and just substitute the entire storage solution with single large capacity system mounted be behind a cap, we can reach up to 1,800 kilometers on 200 bar application. And we firmly believe that that will be a future also for the, for the European trucking space. And at the end, just a just couple of uh, examples of what we have done until today in UK. So this is the project we have committed between 2016 to 2017 with Waitrose. We have converted uh, more than 50 trucks Originally, they were coming with a 9 liter engine from Scania and with type 1 cylinders mounted between the axles. We have substituted those with, with our two cylinders. By doing so, we have increased the capacity by 76 kilograms. We have increased the driving range by 50%. And at the same time, we have reduced the weight of the truck by more than 500 kilograms, which is quite significant because the tractor itself weighs is something 7.5 tons. So it was really interesting and quite significant project for us in Europe. And those units are still in operation. And in September of 2022, they have reached actually 1 million kilometers. Uh, the second example is, is the previously mentioned 6x2 offering with Iveco. We have introduced that product to, to the market last year. There are a number of units which are currently under 
uh, testing with different fleets, and we expect that very soon we will see hundreds of those running uh, in UK alone. And last but not least, the, the state of the art, or let's call it the end game product we want to introduce to Europe, high capacity system mounted behind a cap. This is the demo unit we have committed to, together with Scania in Colombia, again allowing uh, to 1,600 kilometers just on pure CNG or biogas. Uh, and to, just to finish this, uh, we are also present on the market, on the transit market. We have actually started to, to supply our product to the transit space in 1996. So we have very long history on the, on the transit space and currently in Europe on the biogas application we, we deliver product to more than 70% of the market. And just very shortly conclusion, <laughs> Filippo. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. I mean, 30 seconds just to highlight our uh, key takeaways. Today, Europe has developed only 16% of its biomethane potential. Uh, Repower U demands mo more biomethane, but you know it's not only Repower U. So there is really a demand also from other countries. And uh, with our uh, capacity uh, for heavy duty vehicles and with our infrastructure solution, we really believe that we can give our contribution to solve the problem. So let's put words into action. And thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting presentation, two presentations, and I was. Thank you. I have a lot of questions, yes, but I'm going to give the uh, audience a chance to ask the questions you have. My colleague will bring the mic to you if you raise your hand for any questions you have. Lipo, question for you. So, re uh, requalification of the um, of the containers every five years. Are things changing with regards to how many cylinders you need to qualify? Is there a new legislation in the UK, and what does that look like? Okay, thank you, thank you, John. This is this is a very good question. Uh, we uh, hexagon because this will be limited to to hexagon. Have a couple of months ago uh, agreed with the German TUV. We we manufacture our cylinders in Germany, so we that we can extend our in, uh, requalification interval to 10 years. Uh, this is because there is enough data point in the market. I mentioned 1,800 containers. Uh, each container on average carries 1,114 cylinders. We have enough data points in the field to determine that the requalification interval can be extended. Uh, after 10 years today, we will be requested to do the traditional hydro testing plus uh, slow uh, burst and cycling of six cylinders, but that would be really a minor cost. To this point, I would like to add that a third company in our group called Digital Wave has developed a, a modal acoustic emission analysis of cylinders, which provides a lot of information. It's like basically taking an X-ray of the cylinder it provides a lot of information about the, the structure of the cylinders. Already, the US DOT has agreed to replace hydrostatic tests with the modal acoustic emission analysis. Uh, in Europe, it's not a reality yet, but the beauty is not only that we acquire more information, but uh, a modal acoustic emission analysis can be performed on the cylinder mounted in the container without, with no need of disassembling the cylinder. So that would save even more time. But yes, today I can already say we have been uh, awarded 10 years by the TUV. One last note, and sorry that my answer, but uh, it's, it's a quite a complicated topic. The TUV is one of the German notified bodies. We assume that in general, notified bodies of different countries accept what has been decided in different uh, countries. But obviously every country, and sorry for repeating the same word, has to approve and accept what the TUV has determined. In general, we s it never happens that a notified body of a country A uh, refuses what the notified body of country B has decided. So I, I would expect that this can be extended to the UK. I can, I can only add that for the, for the automotive business and for the systems I have presented for light duty trucks, buses, 
Uh, for the entire lifetime of the product, which is 20 years, we require only visual reinspection. So, so once system is installed on the vehicle, there is no need for hydraulic retesting for the entire lifetime of the product, actually. Yeah. Two questions, if I might. The first is on the mobile pipeline. So if you have a truck that's using your cylinders, what percentage of the cylinder volume is being used to transport, and what's that sweet spot in terms of distance you can go so that you justify transporting rather than piping. Um, I assume you wouldn't even need the cab uh, storage if you're using, if you're transporting the, uh, the fuel. The second question is about what is happening in the world of producing dimethyl ether, which Volvo and Oberon Fuels was talking about as opposed to using gaseous fuels or LNG. I take the first yeah. one and then, okay. Uh, so. Generally, filling the container to capacity is an, uh, also a question of compression strategy. But if you uh, overpressurize the gas a little bit, and uh, our container allows to go up to 295 bar, and you cool the gas, you can reach, uh, theoretically, you can reach 100% capacity. 100% capacity means 250 bar, 15 degrees C. Then the question is, when you decant the gas, uh, you need to deal with the uh, limits of the pressure regulator at the decanting station, which is normally a minimum pressure of 20 bar. Uh, you normally don't go that low. So that uh, basically is your bottleneck. It needs to be noted that uh, the cylinders are required to be always pressurized, and we recommend 10 bar. But, but again, that is not a bottleneck. So you would go back home with normally with 20 bar, depending on the spec of the pressure regulator. Okay, so in terms of the uh, second question, we, we firmly, be, firmly believe that uh, manufacturing any other fuel than what we have today, like biomethane, hydrogen, and, and uh, electricity or a diesel, will be very difficult to implement to the market. And the forecast and the cost structure they are presenting for, for that type of development is, is really way off and it represents even higher cost than, than implementing the hydrogen to the market today. So we, I don't, don't want to say we are skeptical, but we have a question mark related to, to business case for that. Thank you. Thanks, perhaps following on from this, in terms of hydrogen or fuel cell vehicles and uh, biomethane vehicles, where do you see, uh, you know, where, where will, will the next years develop? When will hydrogen vehicles become more in the range of much less, more competitive? Or, or how do you see this comparison? So, yeah. The winter. Yeah. So, uh, there is a lot of talk about bringing the hydrogen to the trucking space uh, as early as 2030 and the, and the high numbers. Uh, however, what we hear from, especially from the OEMs, is that they won't start to manufacture trucks be before 2028, 29. And also, uh, I think the biggest missing part is here the obtaining enough green hydrogen as well, introduction of the infrastructure which could support the development. In our opinion, there is a disconnection between the legislation work and, uh, in a way, wishes of the of the legislation's body related to, to the hydrogen, versus the provided practical support for, for that development. So, in our internal forecast, we believe that uh, biomethane, uh, either compressed or LNG, will remain very important part of the equation, even way way past 2030. Hydrogen will come, but it will be significantly delayed, basically, in our opinion. Thank you. Um, any, anyone else? Any questions? Um, that means the presentation was really clear. <laughs> but because we are a bit over time, but we also have some time because of the delay we had. So I have one question to wrap up the session. So if you could, if you could tell me one thing, um, that you would, you would see come to reality to make biogas happen um, immediately if it's a thing. So what would it be? I would like two answers from both of you. Okay, from a uh, mobile pipeline perspective, I would start looking into existing biogas plants mm -hmm. and upgrade them. Uh, and and that, that would bring 
more biomethane to fruition rather quickly. I think today Europe produces 3.5 billion cubic meters of biomethane and already 18 billion cubic meters of biogas. So that, that would be the fast way. Mm -hmm. I can say, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm part of the solution, so uh, I'm a little bit biased, but I, I, I could say that the deployment of a mobile pipeline uh, makes it easy to bring the gas to fruition faster because we can deploy our solution in uh, eight to nine months, mm -hmm. so which is a rather fast uh, interval. Uh, that's also an important piece. Yes. Yeah. I don't know, Milos. So from, I would say from the tracking or heavy duty perspective, uh, I think the most important uh, limiting factor is the European legislation focusing on tape emissions. I think in the entire legislation work, they in a way fail to recognize the well-to-wheel uh, emissions related to introduction of that fuel. We compare it to what is happening in US, and US is currently one of the quickest growing markets on the biogas, especially on the trucking. And if only that legislation work would be, would be copied in Europe, I think that will be more than enough business case for a very rapid uh, introduction of the, of the biogas also in the trucking space. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, Again, thank you so much both Filippo thank and you. Milos and thank you everyone for joining the session and if you have any questions or if you want to contact them, you can talk to them or you can email us so we can get, uh, get you connected to them. And thank you so much for coming thank you. and have a nice evening. Good.